Good afternoon, everyone. It is 1215. So we're going to go ahead and get started. It looks like a few more of you have joined. So if you need the sketch code, we'll give it about 30 more seconds before that disappears on you. So make sure you jot that down. I'd like to welcome you all to our session supporting social and emotional learning statewide. Today, we um, have two other uh, individuals uh, leading us through this learning. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it right over to Lisa Gallagher and Lauren Kazee. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Thanks, Thanks. Carrie Ann. <clears throat> my name is Lisa Gallagher, and I am the MDE lead for social and emotional learning. Um, my background is that I'm a counseling psychologist and I was a high school English teacher. In terms of connections to the SEL work and the My MTSS TA Center, I have um, worked with TMA Morrow and Sheila White on the ISF model demonstration work. I have worked with Dr. Anna Harms, Dr. Steve Goodman, Dr. Ruthie Pano Simmons, um, and the MDE work group to look at uh, reframing the social emotional behavioral screening process. And uh, with Lauren, Liz Newell, and Steve, um, we're working on an integration document to look at how the non academic side of the triangle would work together for an integrated system. It's my pleasure to join you today, and I'm very proud to share the work with Lauren. Thank you, Lisa, and hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Lauren Kazee, and I am a consultant with the Department of Education. I wear several hats around the state, but my um, the hat that I'm wearing today is the SEL consultant for the Department of Ed, and I have had the pleasure of working with Lisa for the last forevers, and uh, we are excited to be able to share with you the work that's happening around social and emotional learning here in Michigan, across the state, with support from Dr. Rice and um, and all of the different folks at the department. So we're looking forward to spending some time with you. We um, wanted to start today. Oh, so let me just give you a little. So this is new to us. And um, so please have grace. I mean, we've done a lot of Zoom. We've done a lot of Zoom presentations. We have never done one in this platform. So please be gracious with us. We spent about an hour practicing last night. And then things change today. So um, I think it's actually changed for the better. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to just cruise right along, but wanted to ask for grace just in case as we trudge through the next hour and 15 minutes with you, we wanna try to have it as interactive as possible when we're in this virtual setting and hopefully we'll be able to do that to some degree. So we're excited to have all of you with us and hope that you find this time engaging. And I know we started off on a good foot making people laugh. So for those of you who missed out, you missed out on some good funny chuckles at the beginning. But on that note, I am not having any luck. <laughs> I just jinxed myself uh, being able to advance my slide. So I'm not sure why that is happening now. Let's see. Oh, Lisa. Oh, my goodness. Let me see what's going on. Well, here I am. So let's see what happens. I think we're going to have to go back to our regular. That's um, fine. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Let's see. Still not advancing. Okay, you want, you want me to give it a shot? Sure. Okay. Oh, here it goes. Wait, I got okay. it. Okay. Okay, great. Let's see what happens. All right, everybody, thank you for crossing your fingers for us. So we wanted to play a little SEL, social emotional learning bingo with you. So if you could please find your expression and put in the chat if you are a one, or if you're anything like me right now and, oh, well, I don't see worried on there. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yes, so I'm gonna make my own. I'm E1 right now, because I'm a little bit worried about how things are gonna go. But if you could put your emotion down on how you're feeling at the beginning of this session. C3 is hopeful. Great. D two is tired yes 
That's a lot of people these days, I think. Uh, we have another hopeful person. A1 is happy. It's great. More hopefuls. All right. Thank, well, well, thank you for that. Um, the reason we play this game is so when you think about how you're feeling, that can impact the way that you process emotion. So for those of you that are tired, it may be a little bit more difficult to feel as engaged in the conversation or in the information that we're going to share today. So hopefully we can help you to shake off some of those cobwebs as we discuss things together. For those of you that are hopeful, I imagine that you're leaning in and excited to hear what we have to share and thinking about the future and how social and emotional learning can impact the lives of staff and students in your buildings. And then, you know, if you're like me, I'm also going to take my E1 from worried and turn that into hopeful and have a positive belief that this is going to go great and that we're not going to have any more snags and we're going to move through seamlessly. So um, thank you for playing this SEL bingo game with us. I think it's important to remember how our feelings can impact the way that we process information or the way that we come in to a learning setting, just not for adults only, but also for students, which is what we're here to talk about today. So I, my job today in our presentation is to give you a little bit of context and to kind of walk you through how we got to where we are with SEL at the Department of Ed and in Michigan across the state. And then I'm going to pass the baton over to Lisa and she's going to share with you some of the things that are happening currently around SEL and then how that relates to the MTSS work that many of you are doing um, in your respective areas. So to give a little bit of context, we received Several, we always seems like receive federal grants at the Department of Education to help support some of our initiatives. These in particular were brought about to help support the mental health of students in schools. And so my job as a consultant began in 2008 through a federal grant that we received to help us to think about tier two services and how we could increase access to support students who are needing tier two services and supports around mental health. So my job was to train educators in particular schools around signs and symptoms of mental health supports for children, and then to think about ways to bring those services into schools, either through the school employed staff or through community employed uh, providers and to help to wrap our arms around kids who would need supports at tier two. We then moved forward a couple other grants a couple years later. We got a safe and supportive schools grant. We called it S3 because everything has to have an acronym, right? And uh, we worked with 22 high schools at the time. They were underperforming high schools. And we, again, looked at the culture and the climate of those buildings and why, we, why they were considered underperforming. What were all of the other pieces that contributed to that, that outside of the academics. So thinking about culture, climate, engagement of families, youth voice, all of those pieces. And as I was again, doing trainings on mental health signs and symptoms with the educators in the building, we started to think about, let's look down, let's look upstream or go back a little bit and think about the prevention around tier one. And if we're think, seeing all these tremendous needs at tier two, what can we do to support students in tier one? And that's how the impetus, that was the impetus of us beginning our social and emotional learning work. So through the course of a couple of years and other grants, as we started to work on social and emotional learning with the input from different office representatives around the department, we were able to start to develop our SEL competencies and some supporting documents, which I will discuss with you in a minute. In the course of that, that work, CASEL, the, uh, the collaborative academic and social emotional learning um, lead or organization contacted me at the department and said, hey, word on the street is you're working on SEL. We'd like to formally partner with you and invite you to be a part of this Collaborating States initiative. They had already done some work with districts around the country. And so we signed on and Michigan was one of the original CSI states. There were eight of us at the time. We were thrilled to be able to have that formal partnership with Castle, and they've been a huge support to us 
throughout our time around SEL. Because of that work, I will tell you that Michigan is one of the leading states in this uh, arena. We get communicated, contacted by other states and by Castle, um, you know, asking us to share our resources with other states. So it's something that we, it's a point of pride for us to know that here in Michigan, we really are national leaders in this, in this arena. We also then wanted to point out Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So my assumption is that any of you who are on this call or in this session have studied this to a great degree when you were in grad school. And we know when we think about students and meeting those needs, that if their physical health, if they're not feeling safe in school, and then if they don't feel like they belong or a sense of value or worth or being wanted, then that can impact their self-esteem or how they feel about themselves, which then thus impacts their motivation and willingness to learn or ability to learn. And so for us with our mental health and social emotional learning work, we think about that hierarchy of needs that to ensure that kids feel safe and feel valued and welcomed and wanted at school so that they can be ready to learn and be their best self. So when we think about SEL and mental health, all of those pieces um, come together to ensure that students are ready to learn. Part of that whole child initiative. We also then think about, and I'm not sure how many of you on this call uh, also love Oprah Winfrey as much as I do, but I highly value the things that she says. I jokingly say that I'm an Oprah worshiper and people make funny eyes at me, but I do love a lot of her philosophy and her perspective about things. And one thing that Oprah says over and over is that at the end of the day, everybody wants to feel like they matter. Everybody wants to feel like they are valued. And I know for me as, as an adult, I love it when people acknowledge my birthday or an anniversary or they're excited to see me if it's been a long time since we've seen each other, which you know, has happened a lot in the last year and a half that we haven't been able to have those close um, interactions. It's the same thing for students, that they want to believe that they belong, that they're, they know that you're excited to see them, that they feel valued, that they feel safe. And for us, our belief is that in safe schools, that's what students feel like, that they feel welcomed and wanted and valued and part of the, the milieu. And so that is our hope that as we're looking at schools to be places for students to feel safe, that SEL, social emotional learning, can be part of that puzzle. So if we were in person, I would ask for a volunteer to read this. Um, but since we're in this kind of 2D space, I will count to 10 and let you read this for yourself. So many times our perspective is students are in schools to be taught, but I don't know how many of you, and I um, don't have access to the chat box, but I'm wondering if many of you thought that instead of saying if a child or if a kid doesn't know how to behave, we teach them, often in schools what we find is that we discipline them or we punish them or they are sent down to the office. So the hope is that as we embrace social and emotional learning, as much as we teach st students to read and we teach them how to do math and science and social studies, that we can also teach them how to behave. And I know for those of us who are adopters of positive behavior interventions and supports, that that is also the philosophy that we help students to think about behaviors that are appropriate or desirable in a learning, set in a learning setting. And that, again, is where SEL comes into play as well. So I'm going to ask Lisa to help me with this. We're hoping that you can use the chat box to uh, maybe write down a few things that you think some of the skills and competencies would be that students would need to have to master our content state standards. So you know, you know, we've got these benchmarks and achievement, uh, different um, thresholds that we want students to be able to to achieve academically, that we test them on the M step. And so what are some of the skills and competencies that students need to have to be able to master our content state standards? So Lauren, I put in the chat 
um, that I hope that children will be able to cooperate and that children will be able to problem solve. And I'll read you when other uh, folks, um, Susan has said to cooperate in small groups with peers is a skill they hope for mastery. To be able to be consistent communicators, Colleen has offered that in the chat. Yes, great. Absolutely. Right. We, if kids are going to be able to read, <laughs> we want to know that they can read. So they'll need to be able to communicate those things, being able to work in small groups. I think about when my daughter was in eighth grade, a long, long time ago that they did so many different science labs in small groups. And that worked out really well for her. So absolutely having that ability to be a team player and work together in teams. Another offering is patience and perseverance. And Kim talked about written and verbal communication. Perfect. Yes, absolutely. Patience is huge. Being able to communicate in verbally and in written word is also a wonderful skill to be able to have. So we think about those. There's also literacy, right? Um, we want kids to be organized, to be able to manage their time, to be able to resolve conflict. There are so many skills that students need to have. I think you said problem solving too, maybe Lisa. So being able to think through those, having that um, executive functioning skill to be able to think through all of that. All right, so here's our next activity then, if you could take some time in the chat. What are skills that our employers are looking for? So when you think about having a coworker next to you, what kind of skills would you want them to possess? Or if you think about hiring somebody, if you're on the HR panel and you're interviewing people, what are skills that you are looking for for your colleagues? So Danette offered um, being able to work well with others. Yes, huge. Colleen offers communication and Beth talked about reliability, the ability to collaborate. Yes, that's a big one to have empathy, to be reliable. Conflict resolution has surfaced again. Yeah. Yeah, because as much as we hate to admit it, there is conflict between humans. That happens. Bailey's talking about how there needs to be an openness to new ideas and thoughts. Oh, I love that. That's great. So what do you think the reason is that we've asked these two different questions and we do this activity? Right, because when we think about the skills that students need to be able to achieve or have that competency with the content standards, and then when we think about the skills that employers are looking for, do you see, as you look at the chat, do you see some similarities, right? So somebody said communication with the first question, somebody said communication with the second question. There is the teamwork, right? Being able to have those interpersonal skills, to be able to resolve conflict, to have an openness and perspective, to perspective share, right? To put yourself in somebody else's shoes. So when you think about the answers to the first question and how those relate to the second question, there is so much similarity. What we know from research, Wall Street Journal, even a survey that was done by LinkedIn, is that we are finding that over the course of time, Employers are saying, and I think the number was 84%, I should have uh, verified that before uh, today's presentation, but it was in the 80s, then employers are saying, eh, you know, we're not really feeling the kids that you're sending down the chute to us, right? We're having a hard time finding uh, employees or candidates that have these soft skills, that have these ability, these interpersonal skills. And a lot of employers are saying, you know, we can teach you how to do the actual job. Like we can train you on the skills for the work, but those interpersonal skills are the things that we can't really train, especially by the time that um, students have graduated and gone into their careers. And they're saying like, oh, we need people who can have conflict resolution, who can be on time, who can organize, who can write and uh, communicate clearly. We want people who are open-minded to other people's perspectives. So those are the things that employers are looking for. And those are the things we have a responsibility to teach to students while they're in our, uh, under our, our care. So we, I wanted to share with you a little bit now as we move into what SEL looks like and where it stands for us in Michigan. 
This is our lens. This is the frame that we use at the department across the state of Michigan. You see on the right hand side that there are those nationally recognized five competencies. So there, uh, and I'll talk about those in just a minute. And you see then that outside of those five competencies, we have classrooms and schools and homes and communities because we want SEL to be able to ripple out, not just to the student, but across the classroom, across the school, across the district, and then into homes and communities. So um, when we then think about, well, let me just say this. So as we were developing our SEL competencies here in Michigan back in 2013 and 14 and 15, they were adopted finally and disseminated in 2017, August of 2017. So it's our anniversary month. But um, we were intentional at the department about getting feedback from educators in the field, uh, whether they were administrators, teachers in the classroom. We also tab shoulders of people in universities who are doing some of this work and got feedback on how do we um, ensure that these meet the needs of all students. We also then sent our spent some time working with a national federal agency that uh, called the Equity Center, and they focus on equity issues across the country. This was back in 2016. And we did some work with them around our competencies. And there was a lot of back and forth, this iteration between um, them and giving us feedback and looking at, we wanted to ensure that we had a lens of equity, that, that the language that we were using in our competencies thought about and was appropriate for all children. However, in the last year and a half, as the um, there has been an increased focus on equity, we have then started to work with CASEL around equity elaborations. CASEL has provided these three tenants, identity, agency, and belonging, that really are kind of this umbrella over those five competencies. So that anything that we do in the state of Michigan around social and emotional learning with any of those five competencies is under that umbrella of identity, agency, and belonging, that we use those through ideas to think about that we are always considering and ensuring that equity is right alongside all of the SEL work that we do. We want to encourage children and students to be able to be secure and know who they are and where they stand in the world, to have that agency and grit to be able to push through and persevere and to feel good about who they are and what they can do and their impact in the world. And then that belonging, which I've already spent a little bit of time talking about but ensuring that they feel like they are part of the learning environment, that they that they have value and that they matter. So all of those pieces are what we are using as we continue to move this work forward in our state. Here are the five components of SEL. So self-awareness, being able to recognize how you feel or how a student feels about what's going on around them their ability then to self-manage and to regulate those emotions. So it's so it's being able to think about how I'm feeling and then regulate it. Um, and then the social awareness. So how do I fit into other people who maybe look different or maybe have different beliefs than I do? How can I take somebody else's perspective, put myself in their shoes? It doesn't mean that they necessarily have to agree, but they do have to at least acknowledge that other people can have different experiences than them. Thinking about relationship skills and how we interact with one another and build those uh, communication, um, listening skills, the, some of the things that all of you even mentioned about having uh, relationships with one another and building those meaningful interactions. And then responsible decision making. So thinking about those if then statements, right? So as students' brains are developing and they're uh, maturing into this executive functioning part of their brain, that they're able to think, if I choose this behavior, then this is either the consequence or the reward, or here's the outcome, and helping students to make those decisions in a responsible, healthy way. So we want to ensure that students are able to build these skills. I will also step aside and say, as my, and I get on my little soapbox here, that we want the adults in the school to also exhibit these behaviors and these skills because students are looking to you as the grownups in the building to demonstrate these for them. They may or may not have experiences at home that teach them these skills. And so it is our responsibility to, to be examples for them around this. So 
my little side, my little side soapbox there for adults to not demand what they can't deliver, but to also be examples for students as we help them to grow in these skills. This is a quick little snapshot of our competencies here in Michigan. We are the first state to have early childhood through grade 12 SEL competencies. You'll see those five that I just reviewed. They're on the left-hand side of the screen. And then these indicators, there are 17 of them. They're broken down by age band. Under each of those indicators, if you ever are so motivated and want to look at the 60 some odd page document, under each indicator are strategies and benchmarks to help educators to be able to um, think through ways to teach these skills to students and to know when they are on the mark for that. So we have in, uh, infant, toddler, pre-K, K2, 3, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10, and 11, 12 uh, competencies for all of these indicators across the board. The link to these is on our final slide. We will provide that to you at the end so you can find these for yourself. As I was doing focus groups with the 70 plus educators around the state, around those competencies, they kept saying to us, um, <laughs> we're not gonna do this if you don't make us, basically was what they were saying. They weren't as candid as that, but that's what it boiled down to. And so we went back at the time and figured out how to link social and emotional learning to, at that point in time, it was the diff and SIF, right? The district improvement plan and the school improvement planning process that has since morphed into this MyKIP, this continuous improvement process. But we are happy to tell you that SEL is still a part of that. There's a strategy bank available for schools to use as they embed social and emotional learning into their school improvement planning process. And we know that there are schools out there that do that, which is, um, which is great. The uh, other resource that we have provided to educators is a crosswalk. That was another recommendation from the field that we take all of those content standards that you see here on the right hand side. So math, science, social studies, English, and also health education. And we crosswalked them with those five competencies, all of those um, expectations that I sh just shared with you. So if you are an eighth grade math teacher, how can I embed social awareness and self-awareness and self-management into my lesson plan for math at eighth grade? Or if I'm a ninth grade English teacher, how can I embed um, some of these SEL competencies into Romeo and Juliet unit or whatever you may be reading at the time? So helping educators to embed SEL into their content so that it isn't one more thing, but it's actually part of the teaching process that happens in a classroom. The other thing about SEL is that it has an impact, right? So there's data and research for the last couple of decades to show that when schools embed social and emotional learning with fidelity across the board, that the things that we want to see improve with students actually do. So those interpersonal skills improve, their attitude, their engagement with school, their motivation to learn, those pro-social behaviors, and ding, 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 friends, the academic achievements also, those academic scores also go up. And the things that we want to see decrease also happen. So those frequent flyers that are going into the office and meeting with the dean, those, those conduct problems decrease. The emotional distress that kids feel, that angst and all of those different um, anxiety feelings that are happening, that also decreases as well as drug use, which is a huge plus um, in addition. I'm going to stop sharing. Everybody cross your fingers because I'm going to try to show a video. And let's see if we can get this to work. Oh, I see you. Okay, let me try to get the video to go. And then I'm going to pass it over to Lisa after that. Telling understandable. Hey, Mrs. Hill. Did you see that? Why would somebody do that? Please go into the classroom. No talking. Quietly. Hey, Miss Mara. We need you inside. How do you think that makes us feel? I forgot my number. What's your name? Jordan. What's your last name? Carter. 
School is hard enough. Come on in, sit down quietly at your desk, and begin writing. This kind of stuff just makes it hard. I said quietly, please. Who's talking? Is it you, Sophie? Don't let me hear. Don't believe me? Please just watch. I'm not up here for me, I'm up here for you. Pay attention, okay? Now somebody answer me. Somebody needs to answer me really fast. Every time we're ignored or yelled at or silent, the teacher takes away what's possible. No horseplay, no running, and especially no talking. Moment by moment. Ms. Garrity, your students' behavior yesterday in the lunchroom is terrible. Next time, silent lunch. Did you hear that? Stay in line and catch a bubble. I'm not playing. If this is education, we're in trouble. Bye, Miss McGarrity. Frederick Douglass said, once you learn to read, you'll be forever free. The way it is now, two of the three of us will never be able to really read. It doesn't have to be this way. Hey, Johnny, how you doing? Good. Good. Everyone we meet throughout our day can make a difference. I've been waiting for you to arrive. All the difference. Good morning, Jordan. Good morning, Jordan. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. How are you? Good. Go ahead and put your number in. Talk with us. Not at us. That's okay. I'll look it up for you. Go ahead, sweetheart. Okay. All right. Teach us what we need to know. That's how we get smarter. Well, good morning, Sophie, Tunisia, and Jordan. And when you talk with us and teach us, give us bigger and bigger words. Now what I'd like you to do, children, is turn around and converse with your neighbor and discuss where the mother might have gone. Words that we can use to read and understand. She is afraid for evil, so she has that money. And that will take us places we can never reach to that. Remember, we're entering the learning zone. Now, how can we show our respect to the children and teachers who are working? We can walk quietly? Yes. Okay, kids, so what I'd like you to do is continue writing your narrative, documenting your emotions, if you were the baby owl and your mother abandoned you in the nest. What can you do? Learn all that you can, so that you can challenge us to be our best. We would have stayed and assisted them in whatever they needed. Share yourself with us, and show us how to share ourselves with others. Give us courage. Give us compassion. Help us find our own voices, so we can become who we are meant to be. Why would you want to serve us? Thanks so much, Lauren. If you um, can uh, share the slides. Oh my God. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Wonderful. There. there we go. So you saw in the um, video, if you had your um, positive behavior lens on, you'd see that much of the part two, the do over in the video, really was consistent with what um, the messages of PBIS are in that children need recognition for their effort. You saw across settings how important it is to have the adults be aligned in terms of their um, their own positive behaviors. I've often heard it said that adults are the antecedents for uh, a child's behavior. And you saw in part two that in the hallway, in the bus, um, in the those less structured settings, when the adults are pulling in the same direction, then children are more likely to be able to model and uh, show their skills in um, being respectful and responsible. You also saw how critical it is to move from a punishing mindset to a mindset that talks about providing guidance and helping children explicitly know what the expectation is. And you can see how the stakes are so very high as we tie academics to um, a safe, predictable, and consistent environment. When I looked at this video without 
consciously thinking about who I was following. I was following the kids. But as you think about your own observation of the video, think about this question in terms of adult SEL. You could see that something happened to cause those adults to shift their mindset, to change the way they spoke to children, to um, model positive behavior. And when we think about the SEL context and we think about how critical it is for the adults to model their own social emotional learning, and you think about system supports, if you could put in the chat, what would you need or what would your colleagues need or what would your teams need or what would your building and district need to support adult social emotional learning? If you could uh, put that in the chat, we'd love to hear your thoughts. The question is, what system supports would you need to be able to assure that you are working at the top of your game in terms of adult SEL? Information, data, training, support, time and support. We're hearing that especially within the context of this last year. Some of the uh, language that I love is how responsive is your organization? Our staff needs recognition. Teachers are our heroes. Clear expectations. One of the things that I causes me to feel very proud of the social and emotional learning work at the department is that there are resources to help adults do a self-assessment, not ever to be used in an evaluation context, but for personal growth, CASEL has provided a self-assessment for adult SEL that breaks out into two pieces. There's a resource that talks about how might I keep this at the top of my mind and uh, grow personally? And then how is it that I'm modeling SEL in a different resource to assure that when I am uh, working with my students and creating classroom community, I have some resources to help me move forward and grow in my own capacity to walk the talk. Social emotional learning is one of those things that will be a great casualty if we don't walk the talk. It's like school climate or any climate and culture piece of work. If you're not modeling it, then um, it's going to be really difficult for people to do the heavy lift and grow and develop in that way because uh, it's a truly um, something where the leader in all of us needs to model our social emotional learning. If you could imagine, if you were in a high school or a middle school and a child saw adults modeling social emotional learning in every single class they traveled to, the dosage of that modeling is gonna um, help that child have a better understanding about how they may develop in their social and emotional learning proficiency. Thank you for your answers. At the department, the superintendent and the state board have looked at what the strategic plan is for the department. And one of the goals is where social emotional learning sits. It's under improve the health, safety, and wellness of students. When we look at those eight goals though, just as Lauren's laid out in the first part of this presentation, health, safety, and wellness are positively redundant with academic proficiency, with um, being able to be a place where teachers want to continue working. So it would help with teacher retention. We wanna make sure that there's adequate and equitable school funding. So some of you talked about what you would need for adult SEL proficiency. That would mean the professional development time and the costs associated with learning to assure that adults were supported to model social emotional learning. When we think about those eight goals, I want you to think of them as uh, um, uh, supportive of one another. And I'd also like you to know that when we measure uh, social emotional learning, we have some instruments that'll help us, data sources, one of which for the our strategic plan is to look at the Youth Risk Behavior Survey that's run every other year. It's a, a data source supported by the uh, Center for Disease Control. And then Michigan in the alternate years offers what's called the Michigan 
profile for healthy youth. I helped develop that survey. It's a survey that measures um, middle school and high school report of the degree to which they're participating or aware of the risks and the ways that they're themselves modeling the pro-social skills that we hope for them. As we think about the direction that we're going, social and emotional learning has become a wildly popular practice in the state of Michigan. It, it I think, stands on the shoulders of the work of the um, whole school, whole community, and whole child work that looks at the relationship between health and learning. And as SEL has emerged along with positive behavior supports, along with school-based mental health. There are several federal technical assistance centers that have worked with our SEL internal work group to assure that we did everything we could to maximize that non-academic side of the MTSS uh, triangle. So MDE enjoys support from the Region 8 Comprehensive Center. That's the federal technical assistance to the department that is going to help us with our uh, social and emotional learning community practice that will happen in September. We also benefit from the CISL Center, and there's lots of C's and lots of S's. The CISL Center, though, would define school safety and social and emotional learning. School safety, not in terms of brick and mortar, School safety in terms of uh, this is a culturally sustaining, culturally responsive environment. Uh, schools are places where those equity elaborations that Lauren talked about of identity, agency, and belonging support each and every child, not just the dominant culture that's in that school district. So CISLS has been helping us look at ways to communicate how important school safety and social emotional learning are. They've also been helping us figure out how to identify exemplar districts that provide social emotional learning and have a high impact for the children that are receiving that instruction. As Lauren mentioned, we're very proud to work with the premier technical assistance center, CASEL, as a collaborative state initiative and uh, with Steve Goodman and Liz Newell, Lauren and I, we also received technical assistance from CASEL and CCSO to look at how is it that we might integrate positive behavior interventions and supports, social emotional learning, school-based mental health within an MTSS structure. So you can see that we, um, are really benefiting from what the research and what the data says about what works to assure that as we work with the field that we're communicating coherence, not separate uh, siloed practices, but trying to work deeply about how we align and integrate the work. One of the things that we enjoy at the department is that our superintendent, Dr. Michael Rice, has said that SEL needs to be in the foreground as a way to achieve those strategic goals. And he has felt that while we're a local control state, that shouldn't be an excuse to not partner with the field to move forward on social emotional learning. So last November, he asked us to look at the 10 regions of the state which are the Mesa regions, and ask for representation from the UP, from Northern Michigan, from Western Michigan, from the Southeast side of the state, from the Thumb, from Central Michigan, and from Southwest Michigan to assure that as our SEL champions in those regions and our children's mental health champions in those regions might come together with the department to be thought partners about how we serve the field. We meet monthly on our SEL webpage. The representatives in each of those regions is listed. We are looking to provide what Dr. Rice calls universal professional development in social emotional learning. We have more than 25 stakeholders and by role, the folks at these network meetings would 
include teachers, student support staff, building and district administrators, regional administrators, and we have uh, a facilitator who works with the anti-racism student group who's at the table to assure that students can give us feedback to how we're doing in terms of social emotional learning and children's mental health. I never saw a triangle I didn't like, and I want to let you know that we have a universal targeted and intensive plan to support social emotional learning. And so number one is what is it that we can do to build a shared language around social emotional learning across the state? There's 80,000 or more educators in this state. Dr. Rice wants to assure that every building in every district has a shared notion of what we mean by SEL. And I can tell you that the compelling why for that is that when you ask someone what social emotional learning professional development they're providing or how it might show up in a classroom, you might hear someone say, as a team, we know it's really important to be kind, or we check in to ask how children are feeling, or we do mindfulness minutes. That's what Dr. Rice might call SEL light, and that's not the understanding that we want for social emotional learning. We want the alignment with the castle definition of the five competencies with their equity elaborations that Lauren was describing. So you could imagine that unless there was some universal way for people to understand what's meant by those five competencies, they could dilute, abbreviate, or have unacceptable variations of the effective innovation that is social emotional learning. And what I mean by that is there's a huge research base for how SEL will increase academic results if applied as intended. So when we talk about how climate and culture are important, we also wanna be very explicit that we've aligned ourselves with those five competencies and we've made sure that we're not gonna talk about social emotional learning without talking about equity and that what we mean by equity is that it's culturally affirming to a child's identity, agency, and belonging. There's a great research brief called transformative SEL that talks about how it is that child, children can be self-determined in terms of their pro-social skills and social emotional learning, and how it is that they can advocate not just for children and peers who are similar to them, but they can advocate for children with whom they find themselves might be different from. So Dr. Rice has asked every educator in every building, in every district, and the way we measure that is two to four teachers, one leader in every building. We've, Dr. Rice has asked them to take a course that Lauren helped develop called Introduction to SEL through the Michigan Virtual. We've been able to work with Michigan Virtual to be able to count um, the degree to which people are completing that course, not just taking the course, but completing the course. And we're, we'll be able to show you what impact we've had. But for today's presentation, I want to make sure that uh, one of your takeaways is that when we talk about SEL, what we mean by that and what we mean by fidelity to that effective innovation. In a targeted way, we're asking ISDs to build the capacity to support local districts in their SEL adoption. And when we talk about adoption, we mean not uh, building level SEL, school-wide SEL, but we're uh, really asking folks to stretch and build the capacity at their districts to adopt SEL, which means looking at central office resources, leadership, teaming, those things that we know help any effective innovation. We're asking ISDs to help local districts to scale up and expand from building level or classroom level to the district. And then in terms of an intensive opportunity to deepen understanding of district-wide SEL, we've launched a SEL community of practice grant opportunity that will begin in fall of 2021. If you wanna know 
your district, how many educators have taken Introduction to Social Emotional Learning, you need only go to the website, the SEL webpage at uh, Michigan Department of Education, and you can go to what's called, this is my favorite part, the GIS map, Geographic Information System. And you can click on that link and you can expand the Google map to be able to find out by district whether or not the buildings in your district, two to four teachers or a building and a building administrator, whether or not they've completed the course. What we're so terribly proud of is that by that criteria, 15% of all districts in the state have completed that course since we started in March. We're quite, quite proud. Anecdotally, I heard a colleague say that you've reached a tipping point in the state if 20% of your districts are aligned in the same direction. We're hoping that one of the side effects of attending this presentation is you go back home and you ask your friends and colleagues to complete the course so that we can move the needle at least from 15% by Labor Day to 20% by Labor Day. Uh, Lauren has, um, if you go back one, Lauren, one of the things that um, I've never seen before is that 24,000 educators have begun um, the work of the all five modules. So it's not just introduction, which is building your definitions, but there are additional modules that help look at the relationship between SEL and equity, the relationship between SEL and trauma, what we mean by adult SEL. 24,000 people have been exposed to that kind of content. And that's something to be really be proud of. When I said that we uh, were going to begin a social emotional community of practice, there was a grant uh, funded opportunity funded by the Michigan Health Endowment Fund to provide support for 16 months to districts as they move from classroom or building SEL to district wide SEL. Michigan Health Endowment Fund provided stipends to the districts who applied and we are able to um, share the 19 districts who will be beginning with us in the community of practice in the fall. Iron Mountain, White Club Public Schools, Fremont Public School District, Martin Public Schools, Beale City, Lansing, Benton Harbor, Coldwater, Parchment, Galesburg Augusta, Concord, Lincoln Consolidated, Ferndale, Southfield, Hazel Park, Holly Area, Crestwood, David Ellis Academy West, and Detroit Leadership Academy. What we're so terribly happy about is that we had hoped for the geographic diversity consistent with what's going on in Michigan. And so you'll see of those 19 districts, you're gonna, you've are gonna you seen that we have rural districts, we have suburban districts, and we have urban districts. So as much as this community of practice our problem is defined as how do you scale up SEL from the building to the district? As the community comes together to wrestle with that, the context that Steve Goodman is so very clear to talk about, the context is built into the process so that we'll be able to know how does that look in a rural setting? How does that look in a suburban setting? And how does that look like in an urban setting? We uh, want to kind of lift up something that may be on your mind that we want to make more explicit. There are several, probably three, at least three big ideas of the benefits of social emotional learning. And Lauren's already talked about one. That is that if you have SEL at tier one, if you have positive behavior integration and supports at tier one, you are enabling a school environment to lay in school-based mental health. We're more skeptical about that school-based mental health work going well, unless you have a strong, robust tier one that explicitly supports PBIS and SEL. Another reason why people 
uh, look at SEL is because of the school positive school climate work, making the school more warm and invitational. And the third reason why people are looking at SEL is that it's an enhancer to academic results. Whatever your reason is, we know that with the last year that we've gone through with the social dilemmas that have been exposed as a result of COVID, that the state is now having an opportunity to accelerate plans they might have had before COVID to being able to lay in mental health, school-based mental health. And there are um, an abundance of funds as a result of the pandemic, Dr. Rice has talked about the fact that we shouldn't look at this influx of dollars as soft money that will only go away as we resolve the effects of COVID. What he says is use this as an audition to build a new, better normal. Use uh, these dollars to do the work that you might have done by assuring that you've got an enabling context in your tier one supports, but that you also are able to sustain and um, contribute to the longevity of access to school-based mental health because you've put it in an infrastructure of MTSS. You've looked at um, your resources and you've built something that's more responsive and adaptive to children's needs. So. Lauren has been a real champion, and as much as she's a lead for SEL, I'm so proud of the work that she does in the 31N side of her work to look at how is it that mental health can be located within the school. There's also 31O dollars that have become available, $240 million across the state for school nurses, counselors, social workers, and psychologists. There are educational equity dollars that came through in the last year that provide a competitive grant program for high need districts. The purpose of the grant was to narrow the digital divide and provide mental health services and supports. And the Michigan Health Endowment Fund is that uh, funder of the SELCOP that I described. We hope that within your own work that you would sort of ask those my kip questions. Do I have an infrastructure to support this? If I have that infrastructure of MTSS, do I have evidence-based practices, effective innovations that work at tier one, two, and three? These dollars might help for what's called a single system of delivery. And without these dollars, you could imagine that it would be much more difficult. We have a window of opportunity and I'm going to look at it as an audition to building a new, better normal. When Steve Goodman, Liz Newell, Lauren Kazee, and I worked on the Castle CCSO um, effort, community of practice, to look at how PBIS, SEL, school-based mental health, and equity, we came up with um, a logic model. Educators with an equity lens are provided guidance for integrating social emotional learning, PBIS, and school-based mental health within a multi-tiered framework. If that's in place and the guidance stays true to the core features of each individual content area and holds up in the integration, which means we don't dilute a practice, we don't abbreviate a practice, we don't uh, put one practice in the foreground and another in the background without inadvertently removing some of the integrity of that practice's core components. And that's what we mean by integrity. If we could provide that kind of guidance and it's tested with stakeholder input and supported with tools and resources, then we believe that educators can be more effective and efficient in supporting the needs of all learners in an equitable man manner. That's the work that we're in the middle of, and we're um, working hard on draft guidance that might um, be a practice guide for practitioners who are looking at how to integrate these different practices. When we think about alignment, 
there might already be alignment between positive behavior supports and SEL. There might already be alignment and integration when we think about the TA Center's integrated approach to look at literacy and behavior. When we look at the overlap between what is aligned, what is shared, we want to make sure that we keep a focus on what is social skill development, what are the competencies and the core components, and is that within a multi-tiered system of support. Steve Goodman and folks at the National PBIS Center gave us this graphic, and we thought that it was a really great illustration of the considerations for integration and alignment. And so you can see on the right-hand side, the academic side of the circle um, is connected to the social, emotional, and behavioral. You can see that the physical environment is something to think about. So what systems are in place, because we know that behavior is situationally specific. We also know when you look at the top of the influencers, what's going on in the community and culture, what's going on economically, what's the geopolitical influence. You could imagine that COVID would sit in that in influencers. You could imagine that the um, racial reckoning that's occurred and our support of Black Lives Matter, you could imagine that those are all factors to look at how to build coherence in the system. And so the temptation sometimes I think is to look at one side or the other, but the fluency and the complexity is to look at how is it that PBIS, SEL and school mental health work together and are differentiated, making sure that we don't act like it's all the same and making sure that it's not so differentiated that it's uh, producing a silo effect in our schools. Um, one of the things, because this is an SEL presentation, one of the things that often gets lost is that our principle of SEL is not just what happens in school environments, but what's happening in, in academic content. So one of our principles that we are staying true to is that social emotional learning needs to be explicitly taught in content. So when Lauren talks about the crosswalks with academics and um, the, the dimensions of the five competencies, it's a layering of how SEL is going to show up in academics and it's a and it's an opportunity for the dosage that I talked about for students in the class in the building and and across buildings unless there's a district wide SEL plan you could imagine that children in elementary school might be supported provided guidance in the development of their social emotional skills and then they transition to another school, they go up to middle school and there's not that same consistency, you're not going to see then children be able to become fluent by the time they leave high school. There's a Nobel Prize winning economist, his name is Heckman, and he studied whether children who got their GAD, GEDs and children who graduated from high school, whether there was any difference in their lifetime potential earnings. And it was discovered that staying in school, that group was able to have more earnings than the group that got their GEDs. And when he unpacked that, it was the social skills that were built in high school and middle school that seemed to contribute to the workforce standards that Lauren alluded to when she asked, what skills do we want to have? So especially for special educators, living, learning, and working, we want to make sure that children get every opportunity across their educational settings, which is why we're making the case for district-wide social emotional learning and to make sure that that's integrated with PBIS and that it's not just those children who are struggling with externalizing issues, but those children who are struggling with internalizing issues to make sure that mental health is laid in. Uh, this is a graphic from um, 
uh, the school psychologists, M Michigan Association of School Psychologists. And uh, one of the things that we know is that currently the field is aligning work. So we're aligning perhaps SEL and mental health. What we want though is to integrate um, to make sure that for example, school psychologists or school counselors or school social workers or um, those folks who are tasked with um, supporting students in, in the development of those pro-social skills, we want to make sure that tier two and tier three don't get siloed away from tier one. So while we think about uh, school-based mental health and about um, our practitioner colleagues, we want to make sure that the tier two and tier three teams aren't disconnected from the tier one, because what can happen is um, the adults in the building cannot own the concept that is advanced by interconnected system framework, which is mental health for all. So we'd like to ask you now to take a poll. I think I need to give my answer. What, what we're looking for is your answer to, have you, um, A, are you not aware of efforts to align PBIS, SEL, or school-based mental health? Or B, that you've seen some educators attempt to align PBIS with either SEL or school-based mental health. And you can imagine that the continuum is going deeper and deeper towards integration. Have you noticed an emergence of efforts to align PBIS with SEL and school-based mental health in a single system? Or D, which would be really wonderful, have you seen an example of a single system that aligns and integrates PBIS, SEL, and school-based mental health? And I'll answer Looks like some people have already started answering, but just started the poll. I'm gonna answer D just to not be cryptic. Um, I have seen an example of that deep integration within a single system. And most of that work has been through the work that the TA Center is doing with Susan Barrett and the colleagues uh, who advance interconnected systems framework, ISF. Looks like um, there's been this emergence of aligning and integrating PBIS with SEL and school-based mental health in a single system, which is, is wonderful. This is an, an emerging practice, and it's nice to see um, that so many of you are answering C. I'm gonna give you just a couple more minutes to let us know this is great feedback. Um, when I talk about interconnected system framework, I want to give you a practical example of how aligning the work of SEL, centering equity, which means community voice, family voice, student voice are amplified, working within a system. This is a slide that came from ISF in a presentation that the TA Center brought Lucille Eber and Susan Barrett into Michigan to provide. And this is just one practical example about how teams, teaming, stakeholder voice, and the work would change. You can see as you look at the red boxes that family and community members are part of that universal team on the front end. We know from Title I that family voice needs to be on the front end in the design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of work. ISF took a page from that book and said that on the beginning, when we look at an integrated system, it has to have family voice. Both family voice as advocates and families giving voice if they're the recipient of school-based mental health, if they're the recipient of their children getting pro-social skill development opportunities in their classes, families having the opportunity to contextualize um, how that work is going so that as they see things improving, they know why it's improving and they have a hand in making things better. We see that across the top of 
uh, the tiers that family and community voice is embedded into integrated uh, into interconnected systems framework. And we also see that um, the expansion of the delivery of services expands. So it's not just stakeholder expansion, but it's also time. So in this model, if we were gonna look at school-based mental health, there's a community and family component that's particularly proud, uh, powerful and can lead to some really great um, outcomes for families and for children. Oh, one of the things that this slide presentation offers is a bunch of links. And um, because the department is committed to compliance for ADA, you might notice a link that um, is broken. How it's been described to me is there's a rumba internet vacuum that's gobbling up documents that's finding that we're not ADA compliant in some of the documents that have been posted on the MDE SEL webpage. You've got Lauren's email, you've got my email, and I would love it if you could uh, contact us and make sure that if you can't get a source document that will help you in moving your work forward, that we can get that for you. In case the Roomba internet vacuum cleaner has gotten that document, we want to make sure, I'm trying really hard to keep a straight face, we want to make sure that you get what you need. I'm going to give you just a couple minutes to put in the chat um, some of the needs that you have, or if we prompted some questions, if you could um, help us walk away with some critical questions that we might answer. If you wanted to, if you had some examples in mind of districts that are doing a great job of integrating and aligning SEL with PBIS and school-based mental health, give a shout out to that district in the chat as well. It's nice to see it, thank you. Right, there is a fidelity tool. So Castle will talk about walkthroughs and I can get you resources for that to be able to look at whether or not the practice is implemented as intended. And Lauren has put in the chat that we'd like to invite you to the first SEL conference sponsored by the department that will be able to um, give you more information. Lauren, would you tell them what they might get if they complete the introduction to SEL as related to the conference? Oh, yes, thank you. So, um, will we receive any? Yeah, I hope so, Courtney. Let's, uh, yes, I'm hoping that we'll just disseminate it out to the world. So, <clears throat> yes, that's the plan. And there will be, we will waive registration for 10 people who complete the intro to SEL course that Lisa mentioned. So if you want to come to the conference for free, then take the intro to SEL and we're going to raffle off and give 10 people free registration. So breakfast, lunch, snacks, a couple of featured speakers, student voice. It's going to be a really, I think it's going to be a really heartsy conference. So we're excited to um, have all of you there. So come and join us and take the intro to SEL course. And with that, I think Lisa and Lauren, unless there's anything else you would like to add, a huge thank you for your time today and sharing with us how, how to integrate SEL into the work that we're doing in our schools. I do have just a couple of announcements um, to wrap us up for the day, and then I will throw the end of session sketch code up as well. Um, Lisa and uh, Lauren, do you have anything else you need to add though before I do that? All right, well, if you're not attending tomorrow, if you could please take a moment to complete the conference feedback survey, you can find that on our resources tab on the left-hand side of your screen. Our informational booths will start tomorrow um, at 8.30 and go from 8.30 to 8.50. And then our first session starts promptly at 9 a.m. Recall that if you are applying for sketches, you do need to be there at the start of the session and I will pull up the sketch code for today. 
So there's your end of session sketch code. If you're applying, please make sure you jot that down on your sketch form. I'll leave it up for another minute or so so you have a chance to grab that. All the information about tomorrow is also in the chat box. Thank you, Claire, for adding that. Um, and again, thank you. Huge thank you, Lauren and Lisa, for the presentation today. It was really, really wonderful and informative.